Hey everybody, this is Matt for the Technoax channel with an update for you guys on January 30th of 2015. How are you guys doing? So I don't really have any big news for this week uh, other than the music that I've come up with in the last week. Uh, as always, the links are down in the description below for you to check out. So because there's not very much going on this week, I decided to try and answer a question from you guys. This one I seem to get quite a bit, and I did answer it once before in a radio countdown that I did in July of 2013. I do feel that it is worth revisiting, however, just because I feel that even only a year and a half later, my processes and my, my equipment and my software has changed enough that I feel that the answer is different. I also have a chance to go more in depth in answering this question since in the radio show I was trying to rush through many questions and also get through 10 different songs at the same time and still keep the video interesting. So here's a question in a nutshell. Basically they are asking how long does it take me to make a song and does anybody help me in the process? That question has a very complex answer because it really depends on what I'm doing in terms of genre and also length and uh, the type of music that I'm producing. Background music, for instance, in the way that I promised you guys at the beginning of the year, really only requires two to four instruments and also a very simplified form that's very easy to produce. There are very few notes and it's very easy to fit those things in in a manner that is very good and very interesting at the same time, very simplified as well. So usually that sort of thing really only takes about two hours to do because there's less to do. And usually I take advantage of some basic music theory to help me along in these kind of tracks. And what I mean by that is Usually pop songs and classical songs have a verse, chorus, verse, chorus structure where you have one part of the music that begins out as the verse and then it switches to the chorus and then it all repeats at least once. And maybe there's a bridge and then another chorus, but usually I do uh, two sets of verse and chorus. If you make these sections interesting enough, then repeating these sections is, is actually preferable to the human uh, ear. It also makes it easier on the composer because it allows for a little bit more breathing room before you set up for a bridge or the ending of the song. So I can come up with a three minute background track about, I, I would say about two hours. That doesn't include the mastering process that I put my music through nowadays. That does add a little bit extra time just because I want to make sure that each and every piece of music that I put out has the quality behind it that I, I want. For rock tracks, it's a little bit more of an involved process. I do all the guitars most of the time on each of the rock and heavy metal and soft rock tracks that I produce. Usually the writing process of doing a rock track with the guitars is a little bit of a haphazard thing where I'm both experimenting around with the notes guitar wise and also making sure that every recording that I, I, I get from my guitars is the best possible. I also record multiple guitar tracks for each guitar part, at least the rhythm parts. This is basic music recording theory that's been around since since Les Paul back in the 30s actually. Usually with rock tracks and heavy metal tracks there is a rhythm guitar that is recorded and panned to the left and then they take uh, another guitar and play the same part as the left and pan it to the right and sometimes even there is a rhythm part that's recorded as the same as the left and the right and it's left at the center Usually I do something like this, although it's evolved over time. Back in the day, about a year and a half ago, I went to the extremes of doing about five tracks. One all the way to the left, one all the way to the right, one 50% to the left, one 50% to the right, and one at the center. I've calmed down since then, and I feel that I don't need to do that sort of thing anymore, just because uh, I did that to try and make the guitars sound better. 
And I've found out that through uh, tweaking my, my gear and also doing the mastering process that I don't really need to do that. It also makes things a little bit less money in my mixes and, and gives it a little bit more of a professional shine to it, I feel. But by far the most time consuming thing on doing a rock track is basically arranging the drums. Now, I wish that I had a drum set and that I could play a drum set. And I feel that if I had the opportunity to try and practice a drum set, that I'd be really good at it, actually. I have a really good sense of uh, rhythm. However, usually I am living in an apartment. And living in an apartment and playing a drum set is not usually compatible with each other. And I really don't have the funds at the moment to afford a digital drum set. Although one of these days I might try and get one, but the best ones out there are super expensive. Like uh, the ones from Roland, I, the best one out there is about $7,000 to give you an idea about what I'm up against in trying to afford that kind of thing. So usually my, my drum sets are basically arranged in MIDI, MIDI patterns through VST instruments. A VST instrument is basically a virtual instrument that you can play on your computer and they have multiple different uh, uh, drum sets out there that you can check out. Uh, the one that I have right now that I'm running right now is Ministry of Rock from Sounds Online also known as E slash Quantum Leap. The drum parts for rock and roll and heavy metal tracks are a lot more complex than electronic dance music tracks. In electronic dance music tracks, the beats are very repetitive, really simple, except for the fills that are on the background. And uh, they don't really change much, except for when you're trying to build up to the next section. With rock tracks, a lot more variation is required to keep things interesting. And my goal in rock and roll is to make the drum tracks to sound as realistic as possible. I, make, I want to make you believe that there is an actual drummer behind the drum tracks drumming away and, and making all these neat little fills and keeping things interesting. Really, when I get through the recording process and I haven't arranged the drums, things sound a lot worse until I've basically figured out the drums and made it ma make sure that they fit with what I'm doing on the guitar side as well. After the drum parts are written, the drums themselves are mixed down into individual components, including kick drum, snare drum, toms, cymbals, and hi-hat. This is done so I can master each and every one of them individually. Each and every part on the rock track undergoes some sort of EQing or effects. The rock mastering process is actually the most intensive mastering that I do of any genre. The difference between having just recording my guitars and written all the drums and then after the EQing and mastering process is night and day. It makes the rock tracks as good as they are and I'm still learning and I'm still improving and one of these days I'll be up there with professionals. So how long does it take to produce? Probably about three to four hours, uh, maybe more depending on the length of the track. I would say that the orchestra tracks and the electronic dance music tracks are tied in first place as, uh, as the tracks that take the longest to produce. While some of the production aspects of each genre differ from each other, ironically they are both some of the most complex things in terms of number of instruments that I have to use. In electronic dance music, for instance, there's usually a lot of parts that overlap with each other. They double up on each other, basically. For instance, if you have a bass track, you probably have one instrument that's holding the melody and an underlying sub bass that's keeping the bottom end uh, together well you may have a little bit of a lead synth following that bass to give it a little bit more bites in some of the dubstep and drum and bass tracks i do have a bit of a call and response thing going on where i have one synth part starting things out for a little bit of a time and then after that uh, another synth part coming in played by a totally different instrument responding to the first part with its own like melody or, or, or rhythm or whatever you want to do. Building up these parts and layering them sometimes requires quite a bit of different synthesizers in the mix. And a lot of times I actually build these synthesizers from scratch because Reason allows you to do that. And it's something that I want to do just because 
I want to be able to create my own sounds and come up with my own particular sound for these electronic dance music tracks. And so usually that takes me about seven to eight hours sometimes to do. Orchestra tracks fall in this general timeline as well. And some of the similar reasons that you can double up instruments to make interesting sounds. There's a lot of different parts going on, call and response. And generally the music theory behind orchestra and symphonic music is a lot more complex than any of the other things that I actually do. The recent track that I did called War Song Councils, for instance, had about 28 to 32 parts within the mix. Now this is including drums, of course. Each individual drum that I used had its own tracks and some of the drum parts were about as simple as basically a cymbal going whang every like four measures or something like that. But it's a lot of stuff to keep track of and you have to deal with things like dynamics and crescendos and trying to implement that kind of thing. And also, a lot of the times I'm locked down to writing one or two instruments at a time just because uh, everything takes up so much memory and computing power. And so the writing process is a lot slower and usually I'm writing the notes in one at a time and uh, basically auditioning each part over and over again until I'm satisfied with the results. And like everything, I put everything through the mastering process, through the Isoto Ozone, uh, to make sure that everything sounds as good as possible. So that's, that's the long and short of it. That's my long-winded answer for that one question. I, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, let me know if you enjoyed that answer. Uh, maybe I'll keep things a little bit shorter this time. Maybe in the future I can keep myself from not uh, speaking so much and keep things a little bit more concise. Uh, that's a lot of things to process, I realize. Before I go, I should mention that I do have a Patreon account. And the reason that I'm mentioning this is because on that Patreon page, I promised that people that donated more than $10 would be mentioned in a... Uh, in a thank you section at the end of announcement videos, which would happen what every one or two weeks from now on. And so I'm here to do that right now because there are a couple of people that actually did donate a 10 or more dollars. And here are those names. They are Omar Ashmoe and Richard Roy. Thank you guys for your support. I truly appreciate it. And I also appreciate you guys, my subscribers and my the people who have used my music, of course. And thank you guys for being so awesome during my last uh, update video, my 50,000 subscriber video. I really appreciate your support. You've got, you guys have always been awesome, and I, I'm totally surprised all the time by the support that you guys have given me. So, have a great weekend. I will see you guys next week.